Well, I, I am thankful for many, many things. I'm thankful to be here with you this evening. And I am especially thankful for the topic that we have to study tonight. But I am, I am thankful for the fact that the topic is not about gluttony after the meal that we've just had. So, so at least I can get by one more time uh, on that one. But at any rate, it is a blessing to be with you this evening. It's always a blessing to be with our brethren at West Fayetteville. And a great blessing to be uh, a part of the Lord's Church and to, to, again, make greater friendships even better and better. Certainly, we, we are indeed uh, a blessed, blessed people to live where we are and to know as many brethren as we do and, and to have such good and great fellowship together. Uh, Van called me a few weeks ago and asked that we want you to speak on what will happen to our children and grandchildren. And I started to say, well, Van, I don't have any grandchildren, you know, so I've got a couple of cats, but uh, <clears throat> at any rate, but we might have, we might could have worked something out uh, about the cats, but at, at uh, any rate, I, I know what I'd like to happen to them. Uh, but we, uh, we, we certainly think the principles apply regardless, you know, whether you're, what stage maybe you are in life. But I guess kind of a short answer, what will happen to our children and grandchildren as we think about that as our topic tonight, in one sense, um, I don't know. Uh, you know, we know that they're in the Lord's hands, and so we put them in the best place and the best hands they can be, and so we have great confidence there. But perhaps many of you have had this statement made to you, and, and I've heard it a couple of times when my children were younger, but uh, not, not very often, but I did hear it a couple of times where someone looked at our, our children as they were young and looked at us as young parents, and they said, I sure am glad with the way the world is today that I don't have to raise kids today. Well, I thank you. <laughs> you know, thank you for saying that. Uh, you know, I, was in, I, I didn't know how to react to that, really. Uh, and I made up my mind. You know, when I got old enough, and I am now, and, and I see families, young families with young children, I am not saying that to them. Because that's discouraging really is discouraging. And you know what? Uh, have you read Romans 1? I think that was 2,000 years ago. And have you read Genesis 6? And you read about the conditions of man being described in Romans 1 and Genesis 6 and, and all the evil and the uh, immorality and the ungodliness that existed in, in those time frames. It's never been easy in one sense to raise children, has it? But it's no more difficult and no more challenging now than perhaps it was when my kids were all younger 25 years ago or 2,500 years ago. And so the challenge is always there, yes. Uh, but let's try to be as encouraging to young families with young children as we possibly can because they need it. You needed it, we needed it, I know they need it. And, and really, when you think about a question like this, what will happen to our children and grandchildren, I, I guess you could go two different directions with this. You, you could go a, the, the negative direction and talk about the, the gloom and doom and the, the negative things that could happen, and certainly that's, that's something that we have to remind ourselves of and have to think about. But then <clears throat> there's the more positive vein and the more positive direction in which we would consider the great things that can happen to our children and grandchildren. The very positive things that are yet to be for our children and grandchildren. And I think that's a very productive way to develop this because <clears throat> in one sense, it is, it is a challenge to know what will happen. And certainly we pray for our children, we pray for grandchildren, we pray for all children growing up uh, in this world whatever time frame it may be, wherever they may live, because it's always a challenge because Satan is always there. And we understand that in one sense, in one sense, that there are no absolutes that we can just nail on, on anybody, but I think there are some general things that we can talk about and that I want to talk about this evening uh, regarding the fact that as a general rule, righteousness produces righteousness and unrighteousness produces unrighteousness. And we kind of want to think about some things in that regard. But, but even that's not always 
an absolute, is it? If you would, think from Matthew chapter 1 for just a minute. In Matthew chapter 1, you have the, the uh, <clears throat> genealogy of Jesus listed here. And think about a couple of people who are mentioned uh, in this genealogy. The Bible tells us in Matthew 1, verse 7, that Rehoboam, who was a, a wicked man, an evil man, he begot Abijah. <clears throat> Abijah was, was an evil man, so... You know, the way, that kind of makes sense. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. That has a positive and a negative uh, application. You can train children to do righteously. You can train them to do unrighteously. And, and this makes sense to us. But then you read after that in verse 7 that Abijah begot Asa. And Asa was a pretty good man. And so now it's confusing. But then you read next, Asa begot Jehoshaphat, and he was a pretty good man. And so, once again, it makes sense to us, you know, both directions, the positive and the negative. But then you keep reading, Jehoshaphat begot Joram, and Joram was a wicked man. Now we're back to square one, you know, when we think about this. Uh, but as a general rule, as a, you know, it, as a general rule, righteousness begets righteousness, it creates, it, it continues in that direction, and unrighteousness, the same thing. Although, obviously, there are exceptions. Uh, there are no absolutes that you can nail down. And what we take from this is that, uh, first, you know, I, thankfully, good news for me, uh, is that I don't inherit the unrighteousness of my ancestors. I don't inherit, uh, uh, evil is not hereditary. And that's good news. I guess kind of the, the bad news is, neither is righteousness. Righteousness is not hereditary either. But I think you can paint kind of with a broad brush, and while there may be specific exceptions to this rule, but with a broad brush, generally speaking, in a godly home that fears the Lord, and walks respectfully in his paths, righteousness is what will naturally follow. In a home that is the opposite of that, where it is ungodly, there is no respect or reverence for God, there is no time for God, no worship of God, generally speaking, unrighteousness will follow that path. Obviously, there are exceptions to that here and there. You read it in that list right there of, of Jesus' ancestors himself. But when it boils down to it, it's all about individual choice, isn't it? The individual chooses how he or she will live, whether it be righteously or unrighteously. So as, you know, we're talking about what will happen to our children and grandchildren, as, as the, the parent here, or the grandparent here, my responsibility is to teach and train my children to the best of my ability to make good choices, to make the right choices. And so that's, that's the, the obligation that we have. Now, now I, I want to go <clears throat> to a, another uh, part of the Bible, back in Genesis, if you would, for a few moments. In Genesis 4 and 5, and I want us to spend a few minutes looking at something in Genesis 4 and 5 that I think kind of demonstrates this, this um, principle that we're talking about that I, I think is the general rule in Scripture to help us help our children make good and godly choices and make righteous choices and how that can have an impact down the road and how as, as the, the person who's praying and working with children and grandchildren, however far down the pike it may be, that, that we can <clears throat> do our best to have as cast as long a shadow as possible over those generations yet to come and those that we have direct impact and influence on that we can cast as long a shadow of for God and for goodness and for holiness and for righteousness, righteousness as possible to help these children, grandchildren, and on down the line make the right choices. In Genesis 4 and chapter 5, we're going to look at the way of Cain and the way of Seth. You recognize our, our first parents, Adam and Eve, uh, the first children, Cain, Abel, Seth. 
Label, of course, is murdered by Cain. And so, so we have Cain and we have Seth. And it's a pretty interesting contrast between the way of Cain and the, the descendants of Cain and the way of Seth and the descendants of Seth. We're not given a tremendous amount of details about either man himself uh, or, or and particularly the descendants of either one of these men. But you have a contrast here that sets itself up, I think, for this general principle at the beginning of time, the beginning of man, the beginning of, of the family, and you know, the first children, the first grandchildren, the first great-grandchildren, you know, you know, what was it, Adam lived like eight generations, you know, you know down the pike there, 930 years. So, so he saw, could you imagine Christmas? Uh, but but how, how rough that, everybody gets a $20 bill. Uh, but, but how rough that would be. Uh, but at any rate, you see in a general sense here, this principle that, that righteousness kind of begats righteousness down the road. And the opposite of unrighteousness does the same. And you see that in, in the way of Cain and the way of Seth. Chapter 4, of course, we're very familiar with the way of Cain. The Bible tells us, you know, at the beginning that he, he worships God in a way that apparently is displeasing to God. And rather than trying to make it right when God approaches him, notice God does not write him off immediately. God approaches him. And as we read the text, verse 5 says that God did not respect Cain's offering and that he was angry and his countenance fell. Verse 6, so the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. I think one translation says, or at least a footnote says, sin is crouching at the door, ready to attack. And its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. It's my understanding that in the original language there, that it's emphatic when God says you rule over it or you master it, that it's emphatic and that you could almost translate it, it would sound a little funny maybe in English, but you could actually translate it, God saying, you, you rule over that. He's being very, what's, what's God telling him? Make good choices. Make the right choices. If you do well, da 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 if you don't do well, da, 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 da. make good choice. You, you master this. It's crouching. It's ready to attack. Just like it is with our children and grandchildren and on down the line. Sin is crouching and ready to attack. You, you master this by making good choices. We understand, though, as you continue reading the text, Cain did not make good choices. And he murdered Abel. He's punished and sent away. And then you read something very interesting when you begin at verse 16. Genesis 16, uh, Genesis 4, verse 16. Genesis 4, verse 16. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. That's a scary sentence just by itself, isn't it? It's not even the whole sentence, just part of it. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. There's a sermon, a lesson just in that. And dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. We're going to talk about another Enoch in a minute, but obviously this is a different one. She conceived and bore Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. To Enoch was born Irad. To Irad uh, was born Mahujiel. To Mahujiel was born was born Meth uh, Methusiel, and, to Meth and Methusiel begat Lamech. Then Lamech, now listen, th these are descendants of Cain. Direct, we're talking about the way of Cain. We're talking about the general principle of how unrighteous choices in ancestors and parents often is reflected in the next generation and the next, because because the first generation, you, you know, the, the parent makes the bad choice, and then the next generation has been guided by that 
example, and so they get further removed from God, right? And then the third generation, the grandchildren, gets even further removed from God than that. And then what happens by the time you get to the fourth and fifth generation? They get further and further removed unless there's some kind of intervention. And I think that's what you're seeing with Cain because read about Lamech. And Lamech took for himself two wives. Uh, I think this is the first instance we have of polygamy in the Bible. Took for himself two wives. And gives their names. Talks about uh, some, some things that happened there. And then listen to Lamech himself. Verse 23. Lamech said to his wives, this is Lamech talking, Ada and Zelah, hear my voice, wives of Lamech, listen to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me, even a young man for hurting me. If Cain shall have be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. Uh, let's count a little bit here. Okay, there's Cain. We've got Cain. What about his children, his grandchildren, and so on? Do some counting here. Enoch, Irad, Mahujiel, Methusiel, Lamech. Five generations. Five generations removed from Cain. And by the time you get to that fifth generation removed from Cain, you have Lamech, who's married multiple wives, killing people just because they wounded him, and bragging about it, and saying, if you thought Cain was a bad boy, you just wait till you see me. And if you thought Cain incurred the wrath of God, just wait till you see me. Within five generations, and I know people lived a whole lot longer back then than we do now, but it's not uncommon. It's happened a couple of times in my family on, on my, my mother's side. It's not uncommon for five generations to be living at the same time now. There may be somebody sitting in this room who's part of five living generations, right? And, and so, so this, this is people who have lived long enough that they know one another, and they're living longer back then, they live long enough, they know one another, and the shadow they're casting is longer on the earth. I mean, if you're generation number, chances are today, generation number one and generation number five are not going to know one another very long. But back then, generation one and generation number five, they're just getting started. Remember, Adam lived eight generations. And so there's a long time to have a lot of influence what kind of influence is it? Well, we're starting with Cain, and he went out from the presence of the Lord, and then you start popping off five generations worth, and what do you got? Lamech, and all the sin that he's bragging about, and all the horrible way that he behaves, and the ungodly way that he acts. I'm not, he didn't inherit Cain's sin. He didn't inherit anything like that. But Cain started a, a ball rolling there that just picked up speed. And unrighteousness and unrighteousness and, and each generation further removed and further removed and further removed from what was right and good and holy to finally you get to what you see there. What about Seth? In the last couple of verses of chapter 4, Adam knew his wife again, and obviously these are things, you know, this is not in chronological order. Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth. For God has appointed another seed to me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. And as for Seth, to him also a son was born, and he named him Enosh. And look at this. Remember what we read about Cain? He went out from the presence of the Lord. When Enosh was born to Seth, then men began to call on the name of the Lord. You keep reading in the next chapter. You know, this is one of those chapters that's genealogies. 
You know, not, not exactly the most exciting material that you ever read in the Bible. But there's something very insightful here. When you read about Seth, uh, if you would get down to verse, uh, verse, five, or verse 6. Seth lived 105 years and begot Enosh. After he begot Enosh, Seth lived 807 years, sons and daughters. Uh, then all his days, 912 years, and he died. Enosh lived 90 years and begot Canaan. And then it tells the same little formula there. And it tells us um, that Canaan lived 70 years in verse 12 and begot Mahaliel. And then the little formula that's there. And in verse 15, Mahaliel lived 65 years and begot Jared. So you got your little formula. And then you get to verse 16. Jared lived 162 years and begot Enoch. The other Enoch I told you we're going to talk about. And this is the Enoch when you go down to verse 24. You know what it says about him, don't you? And Enoch walked with God. Oh, let's count again. Seth, remember he's the first one. You got Seth, you have Enosh, Canaan, Mahaliel, Jared, Enoch. Five generations, just like it was with Cain. I see a pattern here. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe it's just a coincidence, but I see a pattern here. Because in the same amount of generations that it took Cain's family to go off the cliff, it took Seth's family to be said of them, and he walked with God. Righteousness, as a general rule, begets righteousness. And while Cain's family was getting one layer removed and one layer removed and one layer removed away from God with Seth descendants, they maintain closeness with God. So close, so close, that instead of Enoch, he walked with God. Side by side. Five generations. So whose shadow do you want cast upon your descendants? Cain or Seth? You see, we have great opportunities as we think about these things and consider this. And I don't know if God specifically put a formula in here or, or, or a pattern in here. Uh, I, I don't think I'm reading too much into it. But I think there's a pattern there about each ancestor has an obligation to teach the descendant to make good choices, to make right choices. And when we, as the ancestors, teach the descendants to make the right choices and they make the right choices we have better assurance of what will happen to our children and grandchildren and, and, and it comes to us as, as the, the parent in the family or the grandparent or the, the ancestor to help our children and grandchildren and so on down the line for however long our shadow may, may be cast, to make the right choices. And, and so, so it boils down to, to how we interact with our family and, and the spiritual priorities that we have with our family and how, as a parent, we instill those values and truths uh, of the scriptures into our children's minds and hearts. 
and we can do things that will either drive our children further from God, like Cain and the successive generations did, or we can do things that will draw our children closer to God, like Seth and the successive generations, until you get to Enoch, who walked with God. Um, about 12 years ago, in summer Bible camp, and this is my little paper uh, that I took my notes on, about 12 years ago, I asked, I, I was teaching uh, some of the older teenagers, and so, so I kind of I prepped them all week, and, and toward the end of the week of, of that class, I asked them, uh, we, we studied about pa uh, um, parent-child relationships, and, and I prepped them, I had a little bit of an ulterior motive, <laughs> because I was trying to get some information to help me as a parent, uh, but also to help them, it, it, it wasn't an altogether you know, bad thing I was doing, I hope, uh, but, but I, I was trying to, to help these children see, and to help myself see, what are some things parents do that discourage children? And what are some things that parents do that encourage children? And, and, and on this piece of paper from 2011, this is a little notebook paper that I took, these notes as, as the kids, everything I'm about to read you are all the answers that those teenagers gave me that day. All these kids are like in their late 20s now. But everything I'm about to read you these are what the children themselves said in that Bible class. And I'd kind of, I set them up. You know, I made them comfortable through the week so that they, they were very open with me about this. And so here, here are the things that these kids said, um, how, how children are discouraged by parents. And there's about nine things, no particular order. I just wrote them down as they said them. Number one, unreasonable expectations. We don't have time to elaborate on all these, of course. Number one, unreasonable expectations. Number two, severe discipline. Number three, anger in discipline. Number four, inconsistency. Fifth, partiality. This is what the kids are saying. This is not research by, you know, some group out there that spent thousands of dollars surveying millions of people. These are not my ideas. This is straight from the kids' mouths. Partiality. Number six, totally negative in discipline. Notice at least three of these are about discipline, but they never say the discipline was bad. It's the way the discipline was done that was the problem. Uh, number seven, never apologizing or admitting they were wrong. Number eight, constant criticism. And number nine, unwilling to listen. That's what the kids said. But on the flip side, this is what they said about how parents encourage children. Number one, good advice. They give you good advice. Number two, they are supportive. And very specifically, they come to the stuff you do. That's what I wrote down the kids said. They come to your ball games, they come to your plays, they come to all that kind of stuff. They come to the stuff you do. Number uh, three, uh, is it? Um, they reward and notice good behavior. Good behavior is, is seen, it is noticed, and it's, it's even rewarded. Number five, they listen to you. Number six, they are loving and sympathetic with you. Number seven, uh, or six, I think it is, uh, uh, my number isn't correct on here. It was camp, it was hot. Uh, they did special thing. they do special things with you that even cost money sometimes, like paying for your, your ball team uniform and things of that nature without complaining. They do those special things with you, or for you. And um, number last, remember I said they never said discipline was bad, just maybe sometimes the way it was carried out if it was in anger or something like that. The last one I said here, they correct you with positive criticism. That was what the kids said. And, and I share that with you because I think that it helps us see how 
we can help our children make good choices. And, and it, it's very determinate on how we treat them and what we do with them. And are we going to take them the way of Cain or the way of Seth? And, and, and I would encourage families, as we think about this, just, just some things here to, to sort of uh, um, summarize very quickly, without, again, without necessarily a lot of elaboration. But, but I would encourage some things from families. Um, in, in your family, it, it's a family. It's not the military. Don't, don't treat them like the military. Uh, I, I would encourage families to be very consistently involved with congregational activities uh, without saying, of course, worship and assemblies and Bible classes, but also congregational activities. I would encourage families to be very consistent with Bible time and, and devotionals with your children and taking advantage of all those teaching moments. And, and I would encourage our families to have great priorities that our children see nothing else comes before the Lord's business. Everything else is second. Moving from families, think about congregations for just a moment. Because if, if we're going to teach our children to go the way of Seth versus the way of Cain, obviously that's going to imply uh, and necessitate a, a great involvement with a great congregation. Congregations to, to elders who are in here, to uh, just church members, period, who are in here, not just elders, but elders, of course, would, would be in the leadership role. Uh, first, I, I would say make sure that your congregation is an open and welcome place for families. Always make sure that your congregation is an open and welcome place for families. Uh, make sure that, that there are programs provided in your congregation that encourage this kind of positive growth of families in a positive way. That might be lads to leaders. It, it might be another program besides that. But in some way, the programs that help instill the values in the hearts and minds of children where they work together, not just sort of separate and apart and removed from the congregation as a whole, but there, there's an inclusiveness of the whole congregation working together. There's an intergenerational ministry that occurs uh, because sometimes the big mistake is a congregation will hire a youth minister who's a good, godly man with the best of intentions and he does a great job, but the mindset of... of many other people in the congregation is and the older they get the more this mindset happens sometimes uh, take the kids over there and do with them whatever you, it is you do with them and let us do our thing over here that is a mistake it's just a mistake it's usually with good intentions but it's a mistake there needs to be an intergenerational congregational involvement where young people are seeing not, it's not just my parents that do these things, it's all these parents that do these things and it's all these old people that do these things. Elders, go to youth events. Uh, older folks, go to youth events. Have them in your home. Host a devotional of, of the teenagers or the younger kids in your house. Have them in your house. If you can't stand that, at least have them in your yard. <laughs> and do a cookout. But, but have them over there. Get to know the children. Get to know the people. Uh, and, and congregations, uh, I, I would encourage you to have a good, healthy understanding and a good healthy budget for your youth program and, and that it's not just uh, you know some small thing that, that we throw a little bit of money at to satisfy somebody I, I, I pulled out uh, we have a great group of guys that work with our youth at, at Meridianville and I love them so much and they do a great job and, and in the Madison County area we have some youth ministers who work together and they just I love them all uh, they're just wonderful, wonderful people. A lot of great men work with congregations and, and so on. But I pulled out um, some of our, our information at Meridianville, and I can only speak from Meridianville. And, and I'm not saying that we necessarily got it all together. One of my elders is over here. Don't take that too personally. Uh, but, but I'm not saying we necessarily got it all together. But, but I know that one thing that Meridianville does, they, they have allowed, allotted a pretty good bit of our budget 
to help encourage young people and young families. In fact, I pulled it out, and, and uh, it's about 15% of our whole budget. There's about nine areas in our, our budget as a whole, and the third highest percentage behind salaries of four full-time people and two part-time people behind salaries and missions, third highest percentage of our whole budget at Marineville is for the youth. That is money well spent. Well spent. And I would encourage every congregation to have that kind of priority with their young people. Let me close out by reading this one thing. Some of you may have heard this, but it pulls at my heart every time I look at it. I think it's an appropriate conclusion. One of these days, you'll shout, why don't you kids grow up and act your age? And they will. Or, you guys get outside and find yourself something to do and don't slam the door. And they will. You'll straighten up the boys' bedroom, neat and tidy, bumper stickers discarded, spread, tucked and smooth, toys displayed on the shelves, hangers in the closet, animals caged, and you'll say out loud, now I want it to stay that way, and it will. You'll prepare a perfect dinner with a salad that hasn't been picked to death and a cake with no finger traces in the icing. I didn't do that over there. And you'll say, now there's a meal for company. And you'll eat it alone. You'll say, I want complete privacy on the phone. No dancing around, no demolition, demolition crews, silence and you'll have it. No more plastic tablecloths stained with spaghetti. No more bedspreads to protect from damp bottoms. No more gates to stumble over at the top of the basement stairs. No more play pens to arrange the room around. No more anxious nights under the vaporizer tent. No more sand in the sheets. No more iron-on patches, wet knotted shoestrings, tight boots, or rubber bands for ponytails. Imagine a lipstick with a point on it. No babysitters, washing only once a week, seeing a steak that isn't ground, having your teeth clean without a baby on your lap, no PTA meetings, no carpools, no blaring radio, rodeos, no one washing her hair till 11 o'clock at night. Having your own roll of scotch tape. Think about it. No more Christmas presents out of toothpick, toothpicks and library paste. No more sloppy oatmeal kisses. No more tooth fairies. No more giggles in the dark, no knees to heal, no responsibility, only a voice crying, why don't you grow up, and an echo 